All right, we're coming to the end of our list of five visions of goodness. The fifth one is called goodness spreads. Goodness spreads further goodness. We still see goodness identified with the end and with the means, but the relationship is different and the flow and the logic of the relationship is different. The prime example of this vision is Aristotle's ethics. Aristotle described transcendentals, truth and goodness and beauty, properties of being, and they all belong together and we're attracted to them. And the world we live in lacks these qualities, not completely, but they're rarer than they ought to be. Because our world lacks truth and goodness and beauty, these qualities need cultivating in us and around us so that we can serve our purposes. Down in the fog, we live lives of unhappiness. We are unfulfilled. We fail to reach our potential. And that unhappiness, or let's call it wretchedness, is a symptom of our vice, our destructive habits that keep pulling us away from the excellence that we could obtain. In this case, the trip up Mount Fuji amounts to cultivating virtues, human excellences that allow human beings to meet our potential to be truthful, good, and beautiful. So excellence breeds excellence. Excellence spreads. And as we cultivate it and nurture it and grow it, we become more who we ought to be. That is the story of goodness, according to Aristotle. And that's the heart of this vision. Now, if this sounds a lot like Platonism, you're not crazy. They do have a lot in common. Plato and Aristotle are close, historically and relationally. And so Aristotle is drawing on some of the same logic as Plato. But there's an important distinction. Plato's metaphysics tends to flow from the abstract, the realm of the ideal, down to the level of the concrete. So from top to bottom. And so we tap into goodness as we rise up to a better level. Aristotle's ethics flows in the opposite direction, bottom up, from specific things to generalities. And that puts more emphasis on human agents as really the necessary cultivators of the virtues. A goodness spreads vision prioritizes human agency and human initiative making virtue and spreading goodness from one virtuous agent to the next. Hey, that sounds like work, and it is a lot of work. It's especially demanding on leaders because leaders set the tone for those they lead. Uh, a leader of a city, if virtuous, is going to result in a more virtuous city as people follow that leader's example. A poor leader is gonna set a bad example and spread vice among the populace. You can see the logic of leadership trickling down uh, all over the place, in the past, in the present, in the contemporary world, and of course in the Bible. Moses sets the tone for his people and they gradually improve in character. David sets the tone with mixed results. Solomon sets the tone with terrible results. So Jesus told his disciples, set the right tone. The Lord is depending on you as ambassadors of his kingdom. Here's Matthew chapter 7 starting at verse 12. The golden rule, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. Listen to the initiative that Jesus is demanding of his followers. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Then comes the next passage. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, virtuous, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, vicious, bad leaders. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs gathered from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. The Gospel of Matthew is full of those kinds of commandments. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And by that he means be as loving, even loving of enemies, as your father is. Or you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are goodness and you're meant to spread goodness. 
a goodness spreads mentality comes with its own set of frustrations. It easily degenerates into perfectionism, where we get caught up in being a little incrementally better and better. And if we rely on rules and structures to produce that goodness, to foster that virtue, it can easily lead us into legalism, into getting caught up in rule following, which doesn't produce the character it promises. The Pharisees are characters in the Gospels that represent a goodness spreads vision gone haywire. Pharisees actually have a wonderful aim. They want to help Israel be purer, more like the priests in the temple, and readier for the Lord's return. But because of their methods, they've ended up perfectionistic, legalistic, uh, hypocritical. Jesus says they strain out gnats, but they swallow camels. Their rule following has blinded them to the big requirements of the Torah, mercy and goodness and justice. Well, they tithe their spices, their mint and their dill and their cumin. They've lost the plot, but they lost the plot because they were following a goodness spreads vision. That doesn't discredit the vision itself, but it shows you how it can be frustrated. Another source of frustration is that virtuous people in life turn out to be rather rare. Uh, how many leaders are really great leaders? Most leaders seem to be rather mediocre. Warren Buffett is one of the more successful American businessmen of the 20th and 21st century. He said, you need a business that can be run by someone who's incompetent because sooner or later it will be. You can't count on virtuous leadership. The American Constitution is actually built for mediocre leaders. We have a separation of powers where no one ends up in charge of everything because we don't trust someone with everything. We would rather have people divided and having to work together because it'll help protect us from their vice. We have to be protected from our leaders. You might say that's one of the shortcuts that people take in a goodness spreads vision. We're actually going to build our organizations to protect us from vice rather than cultivating virtue. Another shortcut in a goodness spreads vision is elitism. We'll settle on a virtuous few. We'll settle on a few good people, and then those few good people can be in charge of the rest. Well, elitism is a dangerous solution because often those few people in charge turn out to be less virtuous than we thought. And then you get a revolt from the governed, from the masses, who don't see their leaders as examples worthy of imitating. So the American Constitution, or a business model that's vice-proof, is a kind of shortcut that looks to technical answers to problems that the goodness spreads model can't answer itself. You might think of our whole industrial age as one of those shortcuts. Industrialization and other technical achievements actually make virtue less important. You don't need a morally excellent artisan to design a beautiful and good piece of pottery or piece of equipment. You can design it with a factory and the factory will produce high quality stuff. Even if the bosses are vicious, even if the employees are checked out and live their evenings and their weekends however they want. Industrialization doesn't require the kind of virtue that an Aristotelian society envisioned. And that means we can get away with less virtue, and that means we do get away with less virtue. We stop prioritizing it, and people live with mediocre characters. And we live in this paradox where human character doesn't seem to be improving. It might even be declining. And yet, we live in a world that's more prosperous than ever, that's more peaceful than ever, with fewer wars, less violence, and healthier than ever, where we live longer and better. Well, does that mean the goodness spreads vision doesn't work? Not necessarily, but wow, it's a temptation to abandon this vision of goodness and go for the goodness results vision, because it seems to produce what we're after. The thing is, if you're after human excellence, if you're after the true realization of human potential, then more productivity, longer lifespans, and fewer wars isn't going to yield it. And it's not going to yield the kind of personal satisfaction that we get when we rise to our potential. And that's one of the frustrations of the paradoxical situation we live in in our technological society. 
All right, those are our five big visions of goodness. I've noted some common categories here, qualities, frustrations, and shortcuts, and we'll return to those. I want to point out another quality that's common to all of them. Each of them makes something ultimate. Each of them puts something at the very top. Maybe it's results, or maybe it's justice, or maybe it's being, or maybe it's excellence. Whatever that vision makes ultimate shapes our priorities accordingly. And this is a question that I'm going to be asking you. What is ultimate? I've also cited biblical examples again and again in ways that I intend to confuse you a little. Some of my examples have been negative, but others have been positive in several of these visions. Wait a minute, won't you be telling us which one of these visions is the right and biblical one? Well, no. I think the real story of goodness, the real nature of goodness, lies beyond these five. Each of these five might tap into it in some way, but one of the reasons why each of these visions has frustrations and takes shortcuts and tempts people to leave it, abandon it for another one, is because none of these five really tells the full story of goodness. Let's conclude with a few questions that I'd like you to ponder. Where do you see these visions? Where do you see these logics of goodness around you? And where do you see these visions in you? Where are they in your imagination? What are your reasons and what are your motivations for being good or for pursuing what you've dedicated your life to pursue? Take your society's priorities or take your personal priorities and ask, how well do they line up with one or more of these common visions? Am I really ordering my life around a goodness results vision or a goodness spreads vision? Is my society a goodness results society or a goodness spreads society? Is one of these visions dominant in your culture, maybe in ways that have caused it to become your imagination without you realizing it? 